This is the Center for U.S. War Veterans Oral Histories of the National Guard Militia Museum of New Jersey in Seagirt, a partner of the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project. I am Director and Assistant Curator Carol Fowler, and today is February 23rd, 2018. My honored veteran is Harry C. Myers, who served with the United States Army Air Corps in World War II in the European Theater of Operations. He served from 1942 in active reserve, active 1943 to 1945, and was with the 98th Bomb Group, 245th Squadron, 15th Air Force. Thank you for inviting me today, Harry. Your eyewitness account is considered a primary historical source and a valuable contribution to the Veterans History Project. And good morning, Harry. Good morning. I usually say welcome, but I'm in your house, so I won't <laughs> say today. <laughs> I should say also that we are in Manasquan, New Jersey, at the home of my veteran today, Harry Myers. And we also should say how you heard about the project was through a mutual friend, uh, Robert Paraselli, who works with me at the museum. Uh, take me back to life prior to service, Harry. Uh, had anybody in your family served in the military, or were they serving at the time? Not at that time. What about before you? Well, not directly in my family. My father hadn't served in the service. Okay. All right, so you are from the Bronx. Is that where you were when you went into the service? No. Okay. What, what are your memories of uh, Pearl Harbor, the Japanese bombing? What happens? Where were you? What are your memories, and how did that change life for you and your family? Well, I think it affected everyone in the country. Yes. It was a big shock. No one ever expected it, certainly our military, which was obvious when you saw the war pictures. We, I just happened to be at a friend's house when it was announced that there was bombing at Pearl Harbor. And the first thing everyone says is, where's Pearl Harbor? Didn't dawn anybody. In Hawaii. That's where our fleet was. And of course, that was the first move of the Japanese. At the time, I was working in a defense plant. And uh, Everybody in the defense plant looked at each other and said, are we going to join up or what? You knew that the manpower was going to be called very quickly, which it was. But the volunteers were tremendous. Harry, you worked in a defense plant, so your efforts were needed for... Right after high school. All right, so when we went to war, what you were doing as a metal worker in the defense plant, right. that was needed for what, ammunition or no, aircraft? Aircraft engines. Aircraft engines, okay. It was at Patterson at uh, Wright Aeronautical. And they kept you there rather than take you into the service at the time, right? Well, at the time, yes, I was deferred because it was felt that we were needed more in the defense plan at the moment than it should be anywhere else. And in the meantime, while they did that, I was at the right age to be drafted. I went over and signed the papers downtown New York to join the Army Air Force. Uh, I had to go back about three times to uh, finally get a paper which said that at that time I'm now in the inactive reserve. In the meantime, I watched other young men either get drafted or go right into the service. Where were you living at the time? In River Edge, New Jersey. Okay. From there, we st I stayed there, I guess, so uh, after the war, we went back to the River Edge. 
and I lived there until 1960. So why did you enlist in the Army Air Corps? I don't know, except I just about saved it when I was a senior in high school. The guy that sat in front of me has got to join the Air Corps. The guy behind me has got to join the Air Corps. Everybody's got to join the Air Corps. Is anybody going in the Navy? Yeah. Well, it was, seemed the preference of the Hackensack High School kids at that time. The U.S. Army Air Force. Maybe it was a new movie that came out or something, but they were motivated to join the Air Force. And where did they first send you? Uh, you mean when I first went in the service? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I finally, after I had signed the papers, they finally got down to the point where my age and background was needed. I got a call and within five days I was in uniform. Uh, I joined a large group in Newark at the train station and off we went to war in Atlantic City, New Jersey. <laughs> we marched there which is a contingent from not only New Jersey, but New York, Pennsylvania, all the way up to New Hampshire. So there was all of New England, and it was a mob of people that all arrived at Atlantic City just about the same time. Took We went to that old Tremor Hotel, which was a pretty good sized hotel at that time. And that's where we stayed. Uh, are contingent mostly from New Jersey. What kind of adjustment was it for you to go from military, I'm sorry, from civilian to military life? Uh, it was quite a shock, but we were all in the same thing together, so you had a lot of companionship. It wasn't that you were all alone on this. You were, I, all of a sudden I found fellows I knew, I didn't even remember seeing for maybe years ago and we were more uniting again as uh, future airmen. As, as it was, we were all privates and we were like uh, aviation cadet in training, but we still had a long way to go before we became even a cadet. In the meantime, we were in Atlantic City, I guess, about a little over a week, and they had to get us out of there because the illnesses were much too much. What do you mean? Well, what was it called? Bad ink. Huh? Uh, Go ahead. Spinal meningitis right. was breaking out. That's it mainly what it was. Oh, shipping no. everybody out to. And they had to break us up because the, 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 you look out the window and there's the, the meat wagon, they call it, back it up, take another person out. So what they did is bundle us, our particular group, down to Seymour Johnson Field in North Carolina. And that's where we went down to Seymour Johnson. We spent about a week down there and then they finished our paperwork while we were there, which uh, we never even started. The only thing we started at uh, Atlantic City was to take an IQ test. How'd you do? What? On your IQ test. Not bad. <laughs> but they lost the paper. So I, I had to take another one down at Seymour Johnson. Just three of us out of that big mob, they lost the papers. So I had to take another one. This one I went through like duck soup. <laughs> And I think I got, a, I don't know, 145 or something. It was a pretty high mark. Then I, I felt I was too intelligent to waste. So they sent me to school. At that time, they sent us all to colleges to... When you look at it this way, we couldn't make airplanes as fast as we could get those men to fly them, nor the engines, nor anything else. So. Just at that time, everything expanded throughout the country, enlarging the whole basis. 
and we had to be trained to do what eventually became June 8th or 6th, rather, the invasion. And it was all geared at that time toward that. Little did we know. Right. We didn't. Right. But it became quite obvious later that there were great minds in Washington at that time that we could see further than we did. Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Carlisle, Pennsylvania. We were there. Well, I was in a room with five others. They were all from New Jersey. The room next to us was a group of guys from uh, uh, Rhode Island, Massachusetts. So they're all New England boys with us. And uh, that's where our group went. And uh, we matriculated in a hurry. The idea was to get us into, no matter whether we'd been in college or hadn't made college, they figured our IQ was enough to jam us with uh, more math, for instance. Geography, so you know the areas of the different parts of the world. Speak English just a little bit better than where we came from. And a few other things like that. And so we matriculated in college in about four months. That's interesting. Now, um, you were from the Bronx originally, so mm. do you mean that maybe you had a Bronx accent and they didn't oh, want I don't that know, over the radio? Whatever accent I have is what I got now. So. Yeah, I can't really tell. It's uh, my parents, uh, it, whatever Bronx accent was, one thing or another, but the people I associate with in the Bronx, we're not rich people. We we're all kind of making it. Sure. And. Uh, well, we did have some tough eggs there. I went to school with some of them. He had to learn to live with them. And they had to learn to live with me. <laughs> all right, so getting back to your math classes, how did you do with all of the, that training there? Very good. It was, uh, what I was kind of bored with in, in school before that became very easy in the school. I went right into higher algebraic items than we did before. And then we realized that later, that's why they picked me number one as a navigator. We had three choices, bombardier, pilot, or navigator. The number one was navigation if you were the highest. That didn't, they didn't go by whether you're going to be the number one pilot. However, everybody went into training as pilot as right off the bat to get that out of the way. But from What do you mean? Well, first of all, when you finish school on you the job school, as you have three on. choices and we may have put them down as a choice, but it had nothing to do with what the government thought you should be. Okay. They did know one thing, you were going to become an officer and as an officer you had to be one of those. Either a navigator, bombardier, or a pilot. You said everyone went in as a pilot. Does, did you fly as a pilot or no? No, the, the that's the number one choice, the way the government looks at it. Oh. A, you're all going to have pilot training. And then if you can do the basics, you'll probably stay in as a pilot. If for anything that your instructor decided no, you would go to the next thing. But as I said, almost every guy that had gone through this and became a navigator didn't mean he was going to become a navigator. He could have been picked as a pilot. But the, the, the navigators were probably the highest in scoring. We had scoring all the way through on everything. And so you, if you washed out as a pilot, you got to be a navigator automatically. So the but top, sorry. Very so few of them were picked right off the top for navigation. You had, they had to give you some training as a pilot. It's the way that they did things in those days. So how did your life change when you were told that you're now a navigator? Where did well, you go after Carlisle? Well, I went, well, this is, this is the way we step one step at a time. Sure. 
when we got out of there, we went to uh, a school, which was down. It was more or less a waiting period again, but there's still classes and so forth. This, this had to do more now with uh, your body and so forth, uh, exercising, breathing, um, testing for under pressure, you know, these tanks, which would be like underwater, things like that. These were all marked down as each individual. If you know, they found that some poison had slipped through that were not in good shape, they were canceled out right then and there, you know, physically. A lot of them may not even got into the military to carry a gun. So it was very strict. And where, I, huh? where were you then? Well, we went from there down to, uh, where the heck was it? Um, Orangeburg. Huh? Orangeburg or Louisiana? Oh no, that, uh, Louisiana? That, that was next. This, this was what they call a, where they start to apportion it and go to different places. This was, this was down in, uh, oh, the places where, it was in the south anyhow. They had to give the south a lot of business. So that's where we went anyhow. And from there we went, like, I was picked for pilot training. So I went into pilot training. I went to Maxwell Field, Alabama, and on to a flight school down in Orangeburg, South Carolina. So that the, the guys that you met before are all scattered all over now. You have very few that you remember that you're staying with. So you, we corresponded by letter to find out how they're doing and so forth. So I graduated, I guess, uh, I didn't graduate out of pilot training. The instructor did not take to me very well. He had five guys and he knew he was going to wipe out at least three. He didn't oh. want any more than two. Uh -huh. uh, I was one of the three that got wiped. I made about uh, five trips with him. I think that really the... Is that this picture? Yeah, it was in the flight school, yeah. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I enjoyed it, but he didn't enjoy me too well. Uh, was he from the South? Oh, he was, I don't know where he came from, but we were in the South, in uh, Orangeburg, South Carolina. Because you're a Yankee in the South. I yeah. thought maybe there was some <laughs> rivalry. Well, he wasn't from the South. Yeah. I have a funny part. Many years ago, I was flying with another, with an airline, and a co-pilot there, he telling me he was from Orangeburg. I said, what were you doing there? He said, I was flying students. I said, no kidding. I said, I went there. He said, who would you have for an instructor? I said, oh, Orvis. He said, Orvis, did he laugh? He said, when would you, when'd you wash out? I said, about four or five days after I got there. <laughs> and he laughed. I said, were you were an instructor? He says, yeah. He says, I stayed there the whole time during the war. He was a little older fellow. Right. And I said, how many did you wash out? He says, no one. I said, you took five men on at a time and passed them? And he says, sure. He says, they could all fly. <laughs> Interesting. And I said, you were there the whole time? You never flunked anybody? He says, no. I said, what did you think about all this? He says, he, he says, he was a character. Nobody liked him. I said, that didn't help me any. But anyhow, I got to the point where when I washed out of there, I went down to uh, gunnery school. Now I had to wait for a class to form to go there, so I had a week off <laughs> doing nothing but go down and enjoy the sunset and the sunrise. Where were you? Florida, on the west coast. Do you remember where? Fort Myers. The name is the same as mine. So everybody down there thought I owned the place. <laughs> Uh, and that is where you fly into when you go to the Gulf Coast. You fly into yeah. Fort Myers. And that was the gunnery school at the time. 
So we said, well, while we get you into navigation school, you're going to learn how to fire a gun. I had to learn how to fire every kind of gun that the Air Force used. Uh, not only a pistol and rifles and machine guns, 30 caliber, 50 caliber, and how to take them apart and do it blindfolded, how to put them together. And then I went on a range, and one day I broke a record. I wow. shot every one of the birds. What they did was put us in the back of a truck with a ring, a steel ring, and they hand you the gun, a shotgun. And this was after my third trip doing it. I couldn't load the shells fast enough because they were all single shot. And <laughs> this fellow, it was with me, with the corporal, and he'd say, fire! And I'd shove a shell in, and then boom, boom. Well, these birds would come over this way from the truck, that way from the truck, this way. You didn't know which one was coming. But the second time around, I got the idea, and I was ready. I said, hurry up, boom, hurry up, boom. <laughs> I got the record. I got every one of the birds. And I said, I didn't know I was that good. <laughs> good for you. <laughs> but, you know, it's funny. When you start to accept things, it's much easier than trying to fight it, you know, if you know what I mean. So I enjoyed it, and it became sport. So when I got out of there, they gave me a nice new pair of wings with gunner's wings. And uh, then I also learned how to become an armorer. And where'd you go after that? Navigation school. What? Where? Well, they sent me down to Solomon Field in Louisiana. Solomon? Solomon. S-E-L-M-A-N. And I was there about a week. And I enjoyed it. It was good. Nice. I, I really enjoyed going to school. And uh, I found that everybody there was really slugging away and doing the best they could, you know, to learn all new techniques and everything else at that time, which we learned a lot more since. But, uh, but I enjoyed navigation. It became a, it's like a big puzzle that you solve. And about the first week I could, sitting outside the building, we we worked from morning early at sunrise until after dusk. So you had a few hours to yourself. And I could hear singing. And I went, one man was singing. I said, boy, what a nice voice. And uh, I went over, and, and uh, he, that was two nights. I wonder what the heck that was. It was the navigator that was singing. And uh, he was, had been in a, uh, a, a show in New York, and he was drafted and got into the Air Force, and he just graduated. And. Uh, Joel, what was his name? McCray. Oh, Broadway, Broadway, Broadway guy. McCray. Wow. So I went there. And I said, That's incredible. What a yeah. voice! You know, he says this guy belly, belly it out. And I, <laughs> and I said, boy, this is just like being home. <laughs> but uh, finished the school and I did very well. Uh, and, uh, until I had one guy who gave me a ride uh, uh, from the class, classroom instructor, and he, he made serious mistakes because he kept asking the pilot what that was down there, and he'd write it down, and what, that, what is that down there? And here he's got four navigators behind him, each one at a set, sitting with a desk and all the tumbles, and this guy, my instructor, is sitting there asking the pilot, what's that? Oh, right. So he came back and he challenged me on the report of one place. And he said, he named the cities. And I said, that wasn't it. I said, that's, that's the uh, Texas uh, 
school out in the middle of nowhere. And I said, those lights are from school. He said, don't know what it is. And he said, it's so-and-so city. And I said, well, he flunked me for the test. So I got called in the next morning to explain it. And I said, well, I said, I don't know, but I said, if you went over the records and you looked at them, what he said was this and this was this, we're going 85 miles an hour between this place and 340 miles an hour between this place. So I said that to my chief instructor, and he goes, he closed his eyes, and he goes, oh, I wasn't wrong. My instructor was wrong. So what did they do? They left me back for one week. Why? Because they wouldn't dare leave me in there with this guy as one of my instructors who was made such a bad mistake. Why? Because he was listening to a pilot who was not interested in him. He was just saying that's so and so and so and so. And he's writing these things down and he's taking a pilot as though he knew. I said, that ought to teach you a lesson. Don't ever ask a pilot where you are. <laughs> oh, good point. Very good point. Yeah. Everyone has to be responsible for their own job. That's right. You can't lean on another. Well, this guy was, was trying to be a first lieutenant. He was a second lieutenant. And he felt the pilot knew more than he did. Little did he know. And then when they, my instructor, who was a first lieutenant, and much senior than all of the guys there in the classroom, he says, oh, please. he said, don't say anything to anybody, please. I said, okay. He said, mommy, I have to put you back a week. So I left my class and went into another class and, and uh, graduated. Uh, after going <laughs> through school, well, I was with these fellows all that, like three months or so. You know, everything there is power, you know, jamming it, jamming it, jamming it. And you, if you were accepting everything, you could do it. If you're fighting it, you're not going to do it. It's like, why doesn't everybody succeed in college? Because he gets sidetracked. There was no way there for us to get sidetracked until the guy calls for his wife to come down and live in town. Then you get sidetracked. But the guys that are not married, boy, do what you're doing and do it the best you can. I think we had a pretty high grade of people that went into the Air Corps that way. We call it the Air Corps in those days, right. not the Air Force. Right. And, uh, so you finished up in Selman Field at Louisiana? Right. And we graduated there and that's where I got my commission as a second lieutenant. But you still hadn't met your your crew yet? Oh no. Right. No. Go ahead, you can go ahead. Well, let's see, that's... It, it was an adventure. I enjoyed the town. It was a nice little town. And then from there, went home. And then we got an assignment. It came in the mail at my house. Bingo, right up to Massachusetts. Where? Well, we were, what the heck was the name of the field? Westover, Westover Field. It was uh, at the end of the main line of the railroad. <clears throat> so, I wanted to come home on the weekend. I'd have to get there early Saturday morning take the train down to New York, and then take a bus to go home, which is about a three and a half hour ride. That's not too bad. So I got to see my parents, and uh, we had pictures taken uh, at that time of home with my mother, my father, my dog, <laughs> my friend who was now a first lieutenant, and uh, Harold that was. We uh, went back into training with a B-24. We had an airplane up there a little while ago. Okay, that plane. Yeah, the B-24. That's the airplane we flew. 
you can take a picture of it without dropping it, Diane. Uh, yeah, is it heavy? Yeah, and the base is going to come off. Oh, I'll just yeah, hold it like that. Okay. Oh. Where was Harry in the plane? A, somebody grab all that. You got to fall off. Can you turn part. it? Oh, stay on there. Oh. Can't Harry, where where did you sit in the plane? Where did I sit? Mm -hmm. Can you see I or stood not? Stood most of the time in the nose. You see that in the nose? In the yeah. nose? I'll just hold your arm. Perfect. Thank you. There's a, really right good. In the nose, there's a turret for a machine gun. A tool, machine gun. So here you are. You're in Westover Field, Massachusetts, and you finally find out what kind of aircraft you'll be on? That's the airplane. B the Liberator, right. Liberator. That's it, Westover. That's it, Westover. Where's Harry? Middle? Yes, I think so. You know how I know? Can oh. I <laughs> no, could you hand it to me? Mm -hmm. That looks like Harry. It was a great airplane. It had a, what Show they Harry call that. a Davis yeah, sure. wing. Show Harry that one. Show Harry that picture. But, can you see this one? But, Let's get some description from Harry and, and, and memories. This is, this is my crew, but a pretty bad picture. And you're in the middle, right, Harry? No, in the middle is the, is the uh -oh. uh, I missed bombardier. It. Are you in that picture? The, on the right is... If you look at it this way, on the right is the pilot, Dugan. On the left is me. Oh. And the bombardier is the tallest guy. He was a big fella. On the left is you, okay. Oh, and he's on the left there. Okay. This is them also. He's on the left. There's Harry. Harry, I thought you were the tallest fella. Mm -hmm. No, I'm a little guy. Five foot to uh, nine and a half. Oh, thank you, Pat. Okay, so I have the name of your crew here, and I'll I'll just hold it up. Do you remember their names, or do you want me to help you? Dugan was a pilot. I don't know which uh, co-pilot you have on there. Haynes K, K R. K R H A N E S Kearns? or Crisanes? Oh. I can't really. Uh, well, it was, that might have been different. Crisanos, Crisana. Crisanos. It's hard to understand that name. Oh yeah, that, yeah. that, that one must have been. Uh, there was one they had to. Well, they had a couple. They had a lot. They had a lot of wrecks mm -hmm. with uh, with planes. Actually had over 40 missions, but uh, so at least five didn't get counted. Why was that? He, he mentioned that he because they they sent them to like another group or something, and because he was not with his regular group flying the mission. Yeah, we, I didn't, didn't really follow that part of it. Did he did he explain that? Why that was? I think if they had to send him to another group for training but or to fill or in as a, Yeah, as a substitute or something for another. Oh, yes, he did group. explain it, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, because he was a more experienced uh, navigator. That wouldn't get counted as one of his missions. This is very somehow. interesting. So he actually had over 40 missions.
see if there's anything. Move this up. You're going to wind up on the porch again. This sure is a lot of math. Oh gosh. <laughs> Get to how smart he is. Pre med. Oh dear. Patty's a nurse practitioner. Oh. Yeah, we definitely have to get him to talk about that mission that was mentioned with uh, the, the hydraulic line. I could have sworn that when you talked about the 240 plus holes in the plane that a hydraulic line um, by a supervisor or something. January 45. Huh? Some flight they wanted to mention there was something about a hydraulic leak. You remember, Hank? Oh, uh, with the gear? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was, uh, I don't know, that was another one. I don't remember what mission it was. Yep. But we had to... Uh, You're going to go out again. We got hit. Yeah. And... A piece of shell severed the hydraulic line. <clears throat> and I'm not a mechanic, but I could see the hydraulic line was between me and the pilot. I could see the pilot's feet, and here's was the line that was leaking. And I said, if we got to have to get that gear down, we're going to have to do something about it, because normally it will just drop which is okay. <clears throat> but before that, we have to move things. I can't get out because that doors will come up and then I can't get out of there. Because they go into the alleyway that I am. And the alleyway is this high and this wide. And I got to get myself and my parachute, I'm pushing the parachute and that, and the bombardier. So I figured, well, I'm going to try something. And I had my little tool set with me. Mm -hmm. And with the right size wrench, I disconnected the one uh, flow. I forgot just how it went, which side it was on. And I switched the pipe over to the other one. There were those AN connections, you know, they were easy to do. <coughs> and, uh, and I figured this might give just enough juice so that we could move everything. And by God, it worked because uh, it had to do with the steering and the flaps, I mean, uh, not the flaps, but the, the, this is, there's several different hydraulic things, but this had to do with mainly the gear and where we were. The landing gear. <clears throat> yeah. And you fixed it. Yeah, I did. I just ch changing it from the one position to the other so that the, I've forgotten just how I did it, but I did it. And we got down on the ground, and the engineer came up and he said, what did you do? I said, I changed this to this. He says, wow. He says, no, and it worked. I said, it did, didn't it? Yeah. And I said, you know, I said, what I was worried about is I wouldn't be able to get out of that little hole I'm in. You know, because they couldn't move. Oh, if there were no hydraulics. Yeah, the damn doors wouldn't 
and they'd be locked in there. And know. And if we had a crash, like if if the brakes didn't work, this is all hydraulic, you know, we're right. talking about. So I said, the first thing I had to do was to get that to think so the door, damn doors would work. And they worked. And uh, there was just enough fuel when they put the pressure on to stop the plane. And everything went, squirted it out. It worked just enough that we needed it, you know. And it's, it's, how do you think of that? I said, I don't know, sometimes I'm not so stupid. <laughs> Great job. <laughs> Uh, he said, I just did it. And the engineer, he says, he says, I wouldn't know what to do. The engineer, he was pretty good, too. I says, but I just kept looking at these two, two damn pipes right there. And, you know, they're only about so big around. I says, I can see it. If we can get the train and put this one over here and there, just opposite. And it worked. Well, and then he tried to put me in for, to get a medal for that. They just said, no, he said, anybody can do that. And he says, oh. <laughs> <laughs> he tried, the pilot three times tried to get me, instead of an air medal, tried to get me something better than that. Three times? The other time was going to Rome for the hospital. What was, what was the third time? I don't remember. Oh, I okay. I just wiped it out. He says, okay, the reason was, I think we really hit the wrong target. <laughs> it wasn't my fault. It was the command, the uh, the guy who was running the whole thing. <clears throat> and I said, I think we hit the wrong target. And that was the that was the one I said, let's not even think about. I don't I don't even want to be see the colonel anymore. I was a little on the out with him. So you finished your um, your thirty fifth mission. And then it was time to... Well, I didn't even know it. I didn't count them. I, uh, I, th I, in my mind, I thought I might have had 40 some odd. Because I really didn't. Oh, I, I I'm had, sorry, right. I had here guys I flew with that we had to either help the, the, the uh, new pilot or uh, replace a navigator. Well, normally I didn't just replace a navigator. It had to be a lead navigator. And uh, they're not there because whatever crew I was with, it went with that crew. So I didn't have, don't have it. The, it yeah, the credit for the mission yeah. went to that crew, but you yeah. weren't supposed like, like, to be part of that crew, so. Yeah. So it, it would, the captain didn't get it. Nobody got it, really. It's just the guy who was the, uh, uh, navigator in charge for the day, he'd take it. I don't know what he did with it. Lit my cigarettes with it or something. I don't know. So what month was that in 1945 that you finished your last mission? Uh, Before VE Day? March, I guess. Okay. Did you stick uh, around until the end of the no, war? No, they came mm -hmm. in uh, Five o'clock in the morning, they came up to alert the crew. They got a mission, and uh, and we all get up. And I said, oh, "That's funny. I don't remember." I said, Did we have and my world mumbling. Yeah, I guess that's the one we were talking about. Blah, blah. And then he said, "Not you, Mr. My I mean, Lieutenant Myers." I said, "Why?" He said, "You're going home." I said, "What?" Hmm. He said, "Yeah, you're finished." He said, we figured that out inside there. You're, you're done. And he was going to say more than done, but he didn't say that. And then the pilot says, I'm not going to fly without my navigator. And he made a big, big stink. And so I said, who's the navigator? And he told me, I said, oh, yeah, that guy's a school teacher. I said, he'll be a good one. Aww. He's like a school teacher. So he went and he came back at the end of the mission. I'm sitting there waiting for him and he comes in and he says, I don't like school teachers. He says, this guy's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so how did it feel to leave your crew? Oh, very bad. Yeah. But I didn't want to go. And then what even was worse, I came back to New York and said, oh, two weeks to take us from Italy to, the, to New York Harbor. Two weeks. 
We zigzagged the hooks the whole Atlantic Ocean. Everybody was, and we went from one storm to another. We looked for storms because they figured no submarine's got to come on in the middle of a hurricane. So we're flying in, working in and out. These damn storms are up here, then we run down there. We're up here, then down there. And I talked to the, the, one of the mates on the ship. It was uh, Grace Line, it was one of the boats. And I said to him, what's going on? I said, he, he says, they got orders every time we go to straighten out to go where we think we're supposed to go, they tell us to go someplace else. And I said, what happened? He said, because there's another storm there, they want to go through that too. I said, why? <laughs> Submarines. You know, when, when your ship it goes up, you look down and you look like you're on the top of a mountain. You're looking down 40 feet up here. You know, that's the I'm difference in the crest of a wave. And then you're all the way down here. And you look up and on each side of the water up there and I'm saying, I don't like this <laughs> one damn bit. And, I, and this is what they were doing. They were scooting in and out of this damn uh, tropical depressions. Let's call them that. Give them a decent name. Tropical? It wasn't the North Atlantic? It was North. Yeah, well, they it call was. them tropical depressions. Oh. Because we're down south far enough. We're down by the Azores. And then uh, when the, a, uh, the ships would come out of the Azores to refuel us and bring more food. Mm. And that, that was just even enough for them to do that. And then as soon as we got everything, then we thought, oh, here we go again. I said, oh, God. Were you seasick? No. That's good. But there's a doctor. <laughs> you go into the, the, the privy room. There's all men on board, not a woman in a place. You see, there's all these toilets. And I count them. There's 20 on this side and 20 on the other side, back to back. And uh, usually it's pretty busy. <laughs> this doctor, this nice little Jewish guy, I like to listen to him. And I'm sitting outside and he's telling these guys, it's all in your mind now. Now just get your mind straight. He says, and you'll, you'll survive. He says, it's no problem. And he kept went into this day after day. And I said, you're very lucky. I said, you haven't been sick. He said, neither of you. I said, no, but I'm just, I said, <laughs> How long can we keep this up? And the next morning, I go in to relieve myself. And guess who's sitting on number two privy? The doctor. <laughs> He's got number one is all his, and number two is also his. He's leaning over the other one. Oh boy, <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. I said, well, I caught you. <laughs> it's all in your mind, fellas. I don't know. I can make anything an adventure. <laughs> when we came into uh, New York Harbor, I told this story before. We had a guy, he was a top kick sergeant from, uh, he had been in the army from North Africa all the way till we, we came home. They finally sent him home. Now that's a long time. He'd been in, from one combat to another. And he had this white mustache. He, the last couple of months, he did more or less no fighting. He was tickled to death. And he gets up there and he makes us, hey, you want your attention, want your attention. We're, we're pulling into the New York Harbor. And that's where he gets up there and everybody looks up at him and he says, Ladies and gentlemen, he says, take a look to your right. That's Brooklyn. And look over to your left. That's the United States. <laughs> wow. and so he did that. And then you should have heard the ship roar. It was funny. These are the guys that are all ready, you know, to get get home. Mm -hmm. And these guys that have been there for all that time, that's a long mm -hmm. time. They were in 
North Africa through Italy. And he, he was one of the guys. <laughs> what about the Statue of Liberty? Yeah, we could see the Statue of Liberty, but he, that, that was the idea. But he just, this is Brooklyn, and that's the United States. He put oh, Brooklyn Lord where it belongs. <laughs> Did you still have to, uh, well, let's talk about your homecoming. Hooray! <laughs> I'm home. Was there a party? How did you get welcomed home? Uh, well, I kind of, it was just uh, not too much, a lot of friends I went with. But what I did was um, I found out that some of the enlisted men, when, when they came in, they flew in. So they were over there while I'm fiddling around, and I got a hold of them in New York, and I took three of them and their wives to dinner at a little French place I knew downtown or mid, uh, a little below in the 30s on the east side. It was a neat little French restaurant. The French people ran it, and I treated them to dinner. So. That was nice. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> from your crew? Huh? They were from your crew? Oh, yeah, the three guys. Rathmel. And poor Rathmel didn't live four years after that. He always had flushed cheeks. Tall guy from Pennsylvania. His beautiful wife. And he died of a heart attack a few years after. So young. Uh, and the other fellow was got, lived in California, and uh, he was going back. And his wife came to meet him, so she like that. Uh, he was the uh, flight engineer, and this other fellow was um, Junior, who used to be the ball turret gunner. And then when the tail gunner got injured, he became a tail gunner. So he came with his new his new wife. I. I I didn't know whether they just got married, I don't think so, but they, he hadn't been married very long, but he was called Junior. So I, had, there was, I didn't have anybody with me, so I just had the six of them and myself, there were seven. And then we went there, had a nice dinner, and a little wine, and I thanked them all for their work. I never saw her. I didn't see uh, my bombardier again until one time I was in California with the airlines and I went over and met his wife and his baby and he took me into his, he had graduated as an engineer and he was working for a big oil outfit uh, and he impressed me so much because they wore suits. The boss of the company insisted that all his employees and the officers must wear suits, not sports jackets or slacks, suits. Whoa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so you were discharged uh, right away when you got home? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Did they, you uh, use... I ahead. went into, back to Atlantic City and uh, they always had a good band there at the casino. And who was that? Da 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 Louis, what was his name? Louis Prima? Louis Prima. And his wife. He looked like an Indian woman. They called her Louis Prima. And uh, watching the guys dancing there from the hospital with one leg and a crutch, dancing with their girlfriends. Mm -hmm. I says, <laughs> yeah. Was that um, V.E. Day? No, no, that oh. was yet to come. Uh, we, they gave me a little surprise. It said, you have enough points to get out. I do. Oh, yeah, it said, you got lots of points. All combat. And uh, I says, so they sent me up to, um, I can't think of what it was, a little place, a camp, um, 
Kilmer? Kilmer. Kilmer. Camp Kilmer. Mm -hmm. And uh, if anybody remembers Kilmer, trees. And I sat down, and got a sandwich and a drink, and sat down. And two colonels came over, lieutenant colonels. And they both sat. One was a full colonel. And they're wondering whether they should stay in or get out. And then was it? one colonel says to me, if I were you, I'd get out. He said, get, a, get something advantage right now to your advantage before the gang gets out. Yeah. Well, then they, they offered you a, a, a promotion if you go to the Pacific, right? Oh, yeah, they did that too. Yeah. yeah. But he didn't. This was. Um, this was uh, what we're talking about. That was before I saw these colonels. Uh, they offered me not much. They well, number one, I was listed to go back to pilot training. That was number one. Number two, if I wanted to go, I'd get a promotion and go on the B-29s if I wanted to. But they didn't need me, they just offered it to me. Like, you know, here, here's a chart, take what you want. And I says, what about getting out? Well, you take it. You know. And I thought to myself, if I want to work in an airline, the only way I'm going to do that is to get out before everybody else does. I quit. I took leave. And within one month, I had a new job. I was working for American Overseas Airlines. I went to work for them, which was American Airlines Overseas Division at that time. What was your particular job? A navigator. We had, um, uh, let's see, it was uh, American Export Steamship Line at that time. It wasn't American, it was American steamship. And then the government said you can't have, steamship companies can't have airlines. They'd had it for World War, uh, okay. and they took it away from them. Right. So then American bought it and I uh, went with them. I went with Amer uh, American Export, stayed there and then until about six, seven months. And I flew in my uniform in air, Air, Air Force airplane, DC-4s, on the same route that the Air Force had been flying to Keflavik and uh, uh, to uh, Prestwick or into London. And I did that back and forth with an airline with my old uniform with the new badges. You saw the badge in there that I had to wear. So it was an Air Force, Army, Air Force, Air Force uniform, yeah, but you yeah. were flying commercial. Yeah. Mm. But then they, that was because we were on contract. We were part of the Air Transport Command, which is what Smith keeps talking about, the Air Transport Command. Well, I was part of that for a while, but as a civilian. And from that, I went into flying commercial. As soon as they got rid of that contract with the ATC, we got into flying commercial. And I got a blue uniform. Uh, so with the AOA. Did for you five use your? Years. Huh? Did you use your GI benefits? Your your GI bill? I didn't use them at all. Not at all. I okay. figured somebody else could use them. Uh -huh. I would have. I would have liked to bought a house. I would have liked to gone to school, but I couldn't go to school because of a new job. I had to go to their school before I could get a job. So I, I couldn't. I didn't take any of the benefits at all. Okay. The only thing I did was keep up my insurance. Oh, that's good. And I kept that up so that last year I borrowed some money from the insurance company. They sent me a check for $46,000 Wow! and said, this is your insurance for, they, as far as they're concerned, I didn't live past 96. 
<laughs> That's it. So I might as well enjoy it. That they cashed nice him out. <laughs> they cashed you out. All right, let's talk about the Flying Tiger Airlines. Ah, well, I took uh, after I left American Overseas Airlines, which was in nineteen fifty, and um, oh, that was. Uh, Uh, oh, Korean War. Right. The 25th. I left and went with. Uh, I knew a lot of guys from the Flying Tigers uh, who were pilots with the Flying Tigers and flew C4, uh, the P 40, well, the P 46, uh, Hawker Hurricane. Not what the hell was that? <laughs> P-46, well anyhow, from there I went to uh, Tiger, uh, yeah, Flying Tigers and got a job. Navigator? Yep. And I stayed in that job for as long as I wanted, but in the meantime I was Trying to help the airline, they needed help. Boy, I did very well there. They gave me all the responsibility I wanted, but no money. <laughs> Although I did make a little extra, but not nothing like I should have. And uh, I stayed with them for, what, 22 years, I guess. And where did you fly with them? All over the world. But something about 35 missions with Vietnam? Oh, that. I flew into Vietnam, oh, I don't know, maybe over a hundred times. What do you mostly remember about that? Very sad. I enjoyed my part of it. I did not enjoy their part of it because it's when we first did extra work on the Pacific was before Vietnam. We, at the Korean War, I was in, brought guys back to Hawaii from there that were badly battered, and I mean bad, and flying them in a, a hospital ship. And that was very sad. That gives you a nice bad taste of a war to see all these guys banged up. And I made several of them out of Seoul to uh, Hawaii. Then after that, we got bigger airplanes, and then we, from Seoul, we, we, uh, that was the Korean War. In the meantime, we flew a lot of other commercial stuff all over. But every once in a while, we'd, we'd have to get more, so like the Vietnam War. It got so heavy that I was flying up the Atlantic mostly, and uh, I went into the Vietnam War. And that was very sad, I think. We lost one airplane of a good friend that had a at Da Nang, he crashed into the ground in a big, heavy storm, heavy rain. And nobody has ever figured today exactly what happened. He never knew. First of all, said the enemy blew him up, it was carried a bomb. It's just bad weather. It was horrible weather. In and out of Vietnam, we, we, we had some planes that, we, uh, that I was on. We went into, into the little fields in the back where they had one runway long enough for our airplane to land and take off. No name. 
and you, but you find these other little uh, helicopters come in with the all in formation, mm -hmm. and the guys would jump out of the helicopter, and another group would jump in, and off they would go again to another battle. I thought, oh God, the stuff you see on television now is really it, it's really awful. It's a, what what did you do after Vietnam? Oh, I came home. I, I was quite flying, really, old after that. I was all done. I had 30-some-odd years between the military and private aircraft. 30 was a 20... I don't know. 1973. Okay, I just want to make one distinction um, that we didn't cover, that I didn't cover earlier. Oh. Um, that your missions were to Germany, Italy, Romania, Austria, and Yugoslavia, mm -hmm. and that you are a veteran of the European, African, Middle Eastern theater of war. Yeah, that's, uh, that's what the designation was. And you were never, uh, you were never injured. What? In World War II, you had no injuries. No, I just danced around and didn't get hit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Didn't get hit. Did you I join? We had accidents, but I never got hurt. Oh, you didn't talk about, oh, you said we don't talk about the accidents? Or the accidents? Yeah. Well, they're not too bad. Okay. <laughs> well, obviously, you're, you're sitting here today, so they weren't too bad. Um, did you join any veteran groups or? Well, when I came out, I joined the uh, VFW. Here in uh, Masquan? No, up in uh, River Edge, where, where I was living then. And uh, the guy who was the commander, he insisted that I do it. He, his son, was um, a fighter pilot. And he went in just about the time I did, a little after, but he got through quicker. And he was flying these, um, what the heck plane, that's a fighter plane with radial engines. Uh, they make them out in Long Island. Anyhow, he was flying those. And uh, they never heard anything more about what happened. They kept trying to find out what what happened. And they finally, the only report they got was that he was found dead in his airplane, landed on a field, not an airfield, but on a field, like a farmer's field, and he was dead in the cockpit. And that's all they knew. There's shells on hit him. How, what, what kind they were, I don't know. And I tried to find out more, and I never did find out. But. Uh, so you joined the VFW, and did you join the American Legion? The what? The American Legion? No, not yet. They still want me. Not yet? <laughs> <laughs> no, they. Huh. The, the, the thing was, the guy. Who, Owned a big restaurant in in uh, route, uh, route four. Came up, he was a member of the of the American Legion, and uh, he said, "I'd like you to join." I said, "Gee, I just joined the Veterans of Foreign Wars." He said, "Well, you can still join us." I said, "Do I have two veterans organizations at the same time?" He says, and he laughed. He says, "No." He says, "It's up to you." He says, "We'd like to have you," and. Uh, and I really should have, I guess, at that time, because I stayed with the VFW as long as I lived in River Edge, but I got disillusioned more with the poor commander. He was a nice guy, but uh, I had too much of his wife. You oh dare. <laughs> she was a dilly, <laughs> but the, their son was a nice guy, and uh, he was dead. It was, we lost a few in River Edge. But, uh, Did you have any reunions of your bomb group or anything like that? Oh yeah, they do all the time. Did you go? No. They're all over the country, right? Yeah, well, uh, 
Hank actually told me they got the pyramidias. And uh, what is it? The the pyramids they call the the, the group. Oh, you get a newsletter? Yeah, mm -hmm. it or it's not. So you registered um, Harry for that? Yeah, and we got a couple of books from them too. Is that the yeah. is that the one? This is the Air Force Navigators Observers oh, Association. Yeah, that's, not the, that's not it. That's not it. No. So you registered Harry for this? Videos. No. The They're usually on a blue paper. This one is just a navigator. It's yeah. also another group. So you are in more than one uh, veteran group. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of veteran groups. That's good. Yeah. You deserve to be. Did you ever uh, talk about your experiences no, I, to anybody? No. I mean, other than your family? No. And how do you guys get him to talk? Slowly. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you have to prompt him, or just do the stories just come out? Well, what's hey, they, he pulled my teeth. Very occasionally they were coming out, yeah. but not not too often. But now I got to tell you, I think I was in my thirties before I heard his first war story. That's very interesting. <laughs> yeah, we have um, his grandson. My my nephew is a pilot. Um, private pilot and once he started taking flying lessons then Harry would talk to him a little bit more and, oh, and then he could course, relate right Hank had worked for the army all those years and he'll open up to Hank and give him some stories yes mm -hmm. yeah and then I started mm -hmm. doing some research uh, you know finding out about this it's uh, fascinating about yes missions or the group that well I don't so, know it, it, it's kind of different you know when you World War II was a big war, and everybody did something in that war. Everybody. And you couldn't ignore it. It lived with you night and day. And when you read, it's over, it's over. You know, people went back to work. I go down to the bankers and, uh, to get money to buy a car because I didn't have any money. I had enough just about for a down payment. And the girl comes over and shakes my hand, and she was in the Navy. And a guy comes over to, to get, kind of give me the loan. He was in the Navy. So, I mean, these are all people about my age. Right. So every place you went or took, there's somebody that served. Right. And even at those who didn't serve, were working at home in jobs that had to do with the war effort. And everybody suffered. Not enough fuel, uh, not enough of anything, really. Right. And uh, the constant awareness of living on the shore area, no lights at night, right. all kinds of things. And thank God we never got to the point where what happened in the Hawaiian Islands never hit us. Thank God for that. And when you think what happened to, to France and all these other countries, I think we were pretty lucky. We lost a lot of men, a lot of good people. And uh, there's nothing to be extra proud about. It's just that it's an experience. Right. And the experience is wonderful if you live through it because you don't want to go out and do that forever. Although I have seen guys that went to Korea as in the, one outfit and then come back and join the military in another outfit. Like, what are you, war lovers? Oh, God. <laughs> Harry, before uh, I film the rest of your memorabilia, I want to say that I'm honored and humbled that you spoke to us of your sacrifice and contribution that you made in service to our country. And thank you, Harry, and God bless you. Oh, thank you. Great job. <laughs> All right, let me just uh, film the Eisenhower jacket. Okay. Oh, thanks. War. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to the 1930s, they. Mm -hmm. It was during the 30s. They had the last big camp out in uh, Gettysburg and stuff. Mm -hmm. and
the front. Yeah. I've seen movies of it. You know, there were a lot of Civil War veterans still alive in okay. the That's early good. 1930s. They set up the government, set camps up and everything for them there. Well, I, think, uh, I had a picture with my, with my great grandpa. Yeah, my great grandpa sitting on his lap. Do you remember that picture, Patty? No. Hey, it used to be in this room for years. It's you gone. Remember that one? I remember a picture. Yeah, we have a box of pictures upstairs. So yeah, a lot of boxes that. Up there. What is it? My great grandpa. His great grandfather. He was War. sitting, and he had been in the Civil War. I guess. I asked you if you had anyone who served before you. Yeah. That's before you. That's <laughs> <laughs> going pretty far back. I know. <laughs> Um, what do you know about his service? Do you know well, which side he fought on, I guess? he was a drummer boy. Oh. And I said, he was what? Well, she said he was only about 15 or 16 no. when he went, and they called him a drummer boy, but he stayed. And he had his uniform on of the Grand Army of the Republic. And uh, I was sitting on his lap. I was about so big. That would be incredible to have that picture. Mm. Well, Maybe when you find it's it. It's a shame mm. to lose it because... <laughs> Give you a call. Or smell it. Email. Email. email picture of it. I didn't even know I had relatives that were that far back. Mm -hmm. But his granddaughter, or his daughter, was my mother's mother. And... She was born in this country, but they were German. But there were like two generations in this country before my mother. Mm -hmm. But she married a Dutchman, a German, who became who was a baker. My grandpa, mm -hmm. Ranky. The one he used to trip you with his cane. Yeah. No, he didn't well, hit me with a cane. No, he tripped he, you. He just said, just stick it out there and trip me. And he'd say, ha, 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 ha. He would be satisfied if I broke a tooth. That's not nice. <laughs> Poor old guy. It was sad because he was my sort of a symbol. When I was young, quite young, he moved in with my family. And uh, he had cancer. And this old German doctor came up and he took me out of the room and he said, I want to tell you something. Yes. He says, he's dying of cancer. He's not going to live. And I want to tell you, tobacco is the worst thing in the world. And the old man used to have a pipe, he smoked that pipe constantly. Prince Albert in a can, let him out. Hmm. Well, he smoked it. And I would run down and buy a whole thing full of Edgeworth tobacco for him. Pipe tobacco. It killed him. And the German doctor, that stuck with me when I was a little kid all through life. That's why you're still and, here. And I mm -hmm. don't never smoke. <laughs> that was a right. smart doctor back then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I My should goodness. find that doctor and bring him around and uh, take. He, <laughs> he made an impression on me. Uh, but when you saw how that man suffered, right. you knew it was bad. You knew what could they happen. He operated through here to feed him. He couldn't. He's all... I mean, he was a mess. Aren't you flying up to the border? Yes. With who? With uh, uh, American, Overseas. American Overseas Airlines. He did fly in the Berlin Airlift. Okay. Oh, can you talk about that? Huh? <laughs> can you talk about that? What? Berlin Airlift? The Berlin Airlift. Yeah, well, I'm, the first trip I made in there was when I was with American Overseas Airlines and were still civilian pilots. <clears throat> That's great. And that was the, around the clock. Round-the-clock drops. Watchdog. 
No, around the clock drops. Like 24 7. 24 hour a day they were flying into Berlin, right? Yeah, it was. Well, I made two East trips Berlin. in there and a uh, DC 4. That's what it was, DC 4. Actually, the first trip I made there, I wanted to see where Hitler was. And uh, the guy, one of the colonels up there, took me down to the. And uh, we had lunch in this place, and then went down to look at the hole in the ground. And I went down into it, but I couldn't get into the room. They locked it, so they couldn't get in where he died. I was in where he lived. The bunker. In the bunker. Okay. I was in the bunker, but they had one area, and I knew his body wasn't in there. So you know, what are you gonna see when you do go in there? Nothing. <laughs> but it's always been a, where is he? Yeah. Now, when I went in there, this was, oh, the heck did we go in there? It was, hmm. 49 or 50? No, no, it was uh, 19, <clears throat> 1945. Oh. <clears throat> it was in 45. Hmm. It was before the end. Yes, because I spent uh, New Year's 46. In Germany, uh, we had a party in a room. There was one wall blown out, and they had carpets to to keep the air out. It was on New Year's. That was New Year's. That's what that was. Yep. And uh, prior to that, I went down in, into the, looking for Adolf, and he wasn't there. I brought back a piece at that time of the Reich Chancellery, which probably had been thrown away because well, people. It's upstairs. Said, oh, is it? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's a piece of red stone from the. Uh, the Russians took it all apart and brought it back to their homeland for themselves. The whole thing, piece by piece. So I got a piece of the stone before they carted it away. All right, so I just want to thank Pat. Diane and Hank for their contribution to today's interview as well. And I would like to ask each of them uh, what, how they think Harry did today and what they take away from this experience. I was very proud of the fact that he could, at age 96, still give you a chronological order of, <laughs> of what happened. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> He gives us bits and pieces, but this is the first time we've really heard the story somewhat from beginning to end. And, um, well, I left a lot very, out. He's left a lot, a lot out. But thank, he's, thank God. He's been a very private man, and I think oh. he feels very deeply about his service and um, has a great respect for the, the men that he, he fought with. And uh, I think because of that, holds back a lot and doesn't doesn't share as much as he he could. Pat? Well, I've heard a couple new things here today that I hadn't heard before, so <laughs> <laughs> it's really interesting getting nice. the whole history in. And I think uh, it's really something to be proud of. It's uh, a part of American history. We need to definitely um, record and get first-hand information about Hank? I think I've known all along that Harry really made a, a good contribution to his efforts during the war. And, and I'm, as, as Patty just said, I'm, I'm very happy that this is on record now for others to be able to look at and have something to physically see and, and associate with what really went on in World War II. I have to add, too, that I think What's impressed us through all the years that we've known him is his patriotism and how much he really loves his country and uh, has been willing to sacrifice for it. Thank you for your sacrifice, Harry. Again, great job. Outstanding. Welcome home, Harry. <laughs> Thank you. Originally, that was a, a caps uh, thing that we had. That was back in 19, what, 52, 1952.
All right, um, we need to do this. Uh, there's the, this is the air metal itself. Yes. I don't know what this is. That's the ribbon. Oh, and the ribbons, yeah. This is the, um, is this the oak leaf cluster? Yeah, they're oak leaf clusters. Okay. I had actually four of them. But these are, this showed three clusters on this for the air metal. And the war area. I don't know if you can see that. That's kind of hard to look at. Harry, I'm not sure if these are. Can you recognize any of these? I know you used to have no. Yeah, this is a piece of uh, the Reich's Chancellery. Which is. They, the Russians were chipping it and taking it apart and moving it to Moscow someplace. So as, it, as they would chip the bone, I picked this up. It's a nice, solid old German. This is, this is the interior wall, okay. not the exterior. That's how thick it is. Burned to the ground by Hitler's men to get rid of their government. So Hitler built himself his own little place, the Reichstag, and they, no expense was spared. They spent money. This. Yes. Oh, interesting. Uh, that's probably in well, this Carlisle. Is 43. Mm. These captions are great. It's very well organized.